to the top, they cry a victory! B-I-C-T-O-R-Y! Hi! This is Nadine Hurley on Twin Peaks Unwrapped. I can remember. Cotton balls. There was a fish in the percolator. My name's Audrey Horn. Federal Bureau of Investigation, Special Agent Dale Cooper. One day, my log will have something to say about this. Laura died two days ago. I lost you years ago. I miss her so much. Laura. Hey, what's up, Doc? It's Laura Palmer, in case you haven't guessed. We're now doing the Community Rewatch Episode 1, and we've got the 25 Years Later team. Hey, this is Andrew Grievous, obviously from 25YearsLaterSite.com. This is Lindsay Stamius, also from 25YearsLaterSite.com. This is Laura Stewart from 25YearsLaterSite.com. And this is Twin Pete's from 25YearsLaterSite.com. Now that we're past the pilot, we're into Episode 1, they know they're going to do a story. It's going to go on to Episode 2, 3, and I think that's really exciting that they're kind of building on pilot and kind of fleshing out a story. And what do you guys think about episode one? This was the first full episode that I watched after the return. So it was really surreal to kind of come back to this world and see it with, I guess, fresh eyes or maybe the old eyes that have seen everything now. It was it was really interesting. Yeah, that was really cool. I'm in the same boat. I had yet to rewatch any of the original series since uh, the return had ended, and I, I had a pretty similar reaction to Lindsay. But I was also kind of blown away by exactly how much really did happen in this episode. It kind of gets overlooked because it's between the pilot and then one of the most popular episodes in the series in episode two. But a, a lot really did happen in this episode, and I'm looking forward to talking about it with you guys. I was kind of watching and looking to see uh, who made it to season three from this episode. A couple of big losses and uh, a couple of folks that maybe, uh, you know, I, I didn't think we're going to get as much airtime on season three, but they did. You know, the opening with Cooper the position he was in was great to see. I'd forgotten that that was this episode. For me, I think it was just a huge character building episode. We learned a lot about so many people in this episode, which I'd forgotten about. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great point. So w when we get into it in these community rewatches, we do the unseen Twin Peaks. We go into the script. And this month, we've got uh, the Pink Room Burlesque. We'll start with Lucy and Andy at the donut shop. And uh, Truman will come in afterwards. Two boxes of chocolate creams with Jimmy's. A box of maple bear claws, one raspberry swizzle twist, two boxes of jelly donuts. And I'm ordering extra jelly donuts because they're Agent Cooper's favorite. You know, my aunt I told you about with the raccoons? She liked jelly donuts. They were her favorite. But she doesn't remind me at all of Agent Cooper. Her son, though... And one plum frappe turnover. Can I give you three a lift? But Sheriff, there's only two of us. What do you guys think of that? Like, I mean, I think what's fun is that you get to see where they get their donuts. Well, I, I just thought donuts magically appeared there, and it kind of ruins the mystery for me. <laughs> I a place to get them. I yeah. thought maybe they had their own in-house donut shop. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say, is that it's it's almost like revealing that Diane was real. It's like, oh my goodness, there's an actual place where they get the donuts from. That kind of takes away from it. But I like the scene anyway, because it's kind of cute, and it is nice to see them, you know... Picking out the donuts. Why did Lucy pick out all those donuts? It's sweet. I like it. It is sweet. And I, I'm amazed that Lucy already knows Cooper's favorite donuts. I mean, she met him once. and he's She's like, oh, good. Got to make sure you get those jelly donuts. <laughs> and this one here is at the Great Northern. There's uh, Cooper and Audrey. So this is more really an extended scene. Were you a friend of Laura Palmer's? Not exactly. Her father works for your father. Did you know each other growing up? Oh, we knew each other. But there was something about her you didn't like. Everybody liked Laura. She was just Little Miss Perfect. Laura tutored my older brother Johnny three times a week. Johnny's 27 and he's in the third grade. He's got emotional problems. It runs in the family. Do you like my ring? Very nice. My father bought it for me. My father was crazy about Laura. He bought her a pony when she was nine, but let her father say it was from him. Its name was Troy. Do your palms ever itch? 
it's interesting that they chose to take out the bit of dialogue that really connected Ben Horn to Laura, something that we'll notice in other deleted scenes as well as scenes that actually hit the episode. They picked and choose very carefully who they wanted to potentially set up as a suspect. Mm. And for whatever reason, they chose not to add the bit about the horse, which would ultimately show up in Laura's secret diary and make Ben a little bit less of a suspect. And also kind of took a little bit of pressure off Audrey. But she really emerged as a character to watch in a fan favorite sense in this episode. But they didn't want to connect her to the murder of Laura Palmer. Great point. Yeah. Very good point. Yeah, and in the script, Ben Horn actually witnesses Cooper and Audrey talking, and he kind of, like, he sees them, and he kind of takes it in for a second, and he just moves on. And I don't even know if Ben Horn really noticed Cooper and Audrey to leave in the second season, really. But it was interesting in the script, they were trying to make that connection. But, Andrew, you make a great point. I think Ben Horn would have been maybe higher up on, as a suspect if we knew he was somehow connected to Laura and that he was giving presents and things like that. Mm. Yeah. This is something that people talk about a lot about how, you know, Laura's murder was kind of intended to be this MacGuffin, like solving the murder was never supposed to be the thing that happened. So making these character moments stand out more, I think that might go a little bit towards why they removed that dialogue because removing Audrey from the Laura storyline so quickly, it really does set her up to be her own character. And I mean, Obviously, she's one of my favorites, so I have to talk about this scene because it's my one of my favorite scenes in the whole show. But it's still it it's nice to see that in the episode as we see it that they have this this nice character moment between Audrey and Cooper. Whereas if they implicated Ben Horn in that quickly in the second or first episode, it would take away from that I think a little bit. Yeah. But having said that, it's still I mean I love the way that it was brought back in Laura's Secret Diary, which just goes to show how much thought was put into all of this, you know, from the TV show to the books to everything. It makes you wonder, did Jennifer Lynch go through all these scripts? It's like, oh, this is a great little nugget I can use in the in the diaries. Mm-hmm. Good point. In the next scene, we've got the Johnson house and uh, Norma is picking up Shelly. I mean, Shelly knows that Norma's there in the show, but we never actually see them together when she gets picked up. Leo sure keeps that truck up, doesn't he? He sure does. We're sure a couple of characters, aren't we, Shelley? Norma, you said a mouthful and then some. Guys. Guys. You hear what happened at the roadhouse last night? No. Big fight. Bobby Briggs hit Ed Hurley with some brass knuckles. Bobby hit Ed? Weird. Ed's got a concussion. Then Bobby and Mike got into it with the bookhouse boys. Took two patrol cars to break it up. Bobby and Mike are probably still in jail. Guys. Guys. First of all, that was a very as the world turns moment there with uh, Norma describing everything, you know, previously in Twin Peaks. <laughs> <laughs> Before she picks her up, I did want to say that you know, Shelly really slowed the investigation down by hiding that shirt, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. it sure made a circuitous route to the police because she pulled that out of there thinking that Leo, you know, was clearly up to no good. Who knows what? Maybe Laura's murder. But I do think hearing that makes me say I'm glad that they didn't include it because, first of all, Norma and Shelly's relationship, I like how they commiserated about their guy troubles differently than you know, if they did it there and then at the diner. And um, I, I think the diner is where where they they work best. In this scene, they're kind of like, I know that you're with Bobby and Shelly knows that Norma's with Big Ed, but they're not saying anything. So they're kind of, mm-hmm. I, I thought that was an interesting kind of play. They kind of get away from that, that it was a secret. But, you know, in the pilot, Norma thinks that maybe Shelly's with Bobby. So the next one is the Hayward living room and Donna and her mother. And again, I think this might be an extended scene because there is in this episode... Donna and her mom talking. Can this be between you and me? Of course it can. James and Laura were seeing each other the last two months. They fell in love. I was the only one who knew about it. James was so good for her. You don't know how troubled Laura was, the kind of trouble she was in, and how much she wanted to get away from Bobby. I've been waiting for something like this about Bobby. And what about Mike? Mom, Laura and I made a pact. We wanted to get away from them, from both of them. So are you saying 
You think Bobby had something to do with Laura's death? I don't know. I think Bobby's dangerous. I think he's capable of almost anything. What do you tell the police? Nothing. I don't have any proof of anything. And what's terrible is James was with Laura the night she died. But Mom, I know he didn't do it. Last night, I had to see him. We were the two people closest to her in the world. But I feel so bad. This scene is really intriguing to me and might be one of my favorite reduced scenes from this episode because, again, they made a conscious choice to take Bobby out of the equation when it comes to suspects. Mm. Bobby in the pilot was the first to be interrogated and then was cleared. And in this episode, they really could have made him a target again by dropping that line about Bobby being dangerous. But instead, they had a different path for his character, and they decided ultimately, like, okay, we want Bobby to be a big part of our young romance, our young love storylines with Shelley, and let's get him out of the murder investigation. So I found that to be really telling. Continue what Andrew's saying. In removing Bobby again, the scene as we got it in the episode kind of puts Donna and her mom in a more mother-daughter light, whereas this conversation seems more like the thing that Donna would say to another girlfriend, right? Mm. So it changes their dynamic a little bit for the better, I think. We don't know what they would have done differently, you know, in future episodes if this had been kept in, but knowing where their relationship ends up, this was a little bit jarring, I think. It's a nice scene, and it is interesting, ultimately, why they chose to remove it. But I think Andrew's right that it has something to do with removing those characters from the equation, from the murder investigation, in order to focus on maybe some of those more deeper character moments. Definitely. All I have to say about that clip, I enjoyed it because, for me, it was portrayed as Moira Kelly's Donna. How dare you! And that's my favorite Donna, and I have to say that's... I, I like that clip because of that reason alone. <laughs> What I thought was interesting about the scene was that maybe think that like, so the parents do have some concern about Mike, you know, like they, they raised a, a really wonderful daughter mm -hmm. and they trust her, but there is some concern about the relationship that she's in and stuff. Yeah. And it starts with Bobby, but then it's like, okay, and what about Mike here? Is he somebody you really should be hanging out with? So. Mm -hmm. The next one we have is at the Great Northern Hotel office and it's Leland and Ben. Palmer. P-A-L. M-E-R. Yes, that's correct. My daughter. Her name was Laura. I'm calling to make the arrangements. The funeral. Everything. I want everything taken care of. I don't care how much it costs. And if you don't mind, I'd prefer that we not even discuss money. I don't understand the question. What's the difference? What do you mean, leak? Seepage? I think I... No. Don't! Don't tell me! Don't tell me! Take him to the lounge and call Dr. Jacoby. This is Benjamin Horn. Who am I speaking to? Fine. Mahogany Antique? Well, you can forget that, Mr. Formaldehyde. I'm picking up the tab here, and you vampires are not taking a bite out of my checkbook in order to exploit my colleague's tragedy. Start thinking lead. Leland's mental state would obviously be a big topic of conversation in future episodes. It's interesting that they chose to not play it up in this first episode. I don't really know why. Um, that could be kind of an interesting topic for us to discuss here. Why does the gang think that they took that scene out? Because, you know, obviously at the end of episode two, we would see a scene where Leland kind of mentally crumbled and then the funeral mm. when he most notoriously did and it almost became a little bit of an ongoing gag watching Leland in public states melting down so why did they choose to remove that here was it for time was it for another reason I don't know but I'm curious to hear your guys's thoughts I tend to think it might be that you know they had the funeral related meltdown where he falls on the casket the party you know collapse I, I don't know I, I I think almost this scene is worse for Leland than the the funeral. Uh, talking about seepage and leaking, and you know, it wouldn't certainly build. That could be the high, well, the low point of uh, you know what he had to hear from or see. Yeah, I'm sure the the casket going down was was something, but uh, just gives me the creeps. And uh, I I think maybe they they were building to that. 
Yeah, and it definitely feels like that reflects on Laura almost in a way. Like it makes it real. It makes it she's she's not this idealized picture that we've seen, even though she's dead, she's you know, beautiful dead, right? Then you have to think about leakage and seeping and stuff associated with that. It just brings it to a different level almost. So um I totally agree with Pete that it it's too much almost. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think they probably took it out as well because of Ben again and the fact that he was paying for it and that would have put him in the picture again so maybe that's where they took it out. I agree there's better Leland scenes in the future and there's actually another Ben where he's at, he's at the morgue I think he's trying he's basically saying I'm I'm representing the family mm -hmm. and we got to get this body to the funeral and so better scenes between both Leland and Ben that are de dealing with the same thing basically. This next one is interrogation room Cooper and Mike Nelson. So tell me, Mike, what are you doing hanging around with a guy like Bobby Briggs? He's my friend. You don't seem like such a bad kid to me, but Bobby Briggs could drag you straight into hell. How long has Donna Hayward been your girlfriend? Around two years. Why were you screaming at her and roughing her up last night at the roadhouse? That's between her and me. Between you and her? Or you, her, and James Hurley? What's that supposed to mean? You guys were out looking for James last night. That's right. He was fooling around with Laura. Next thing we know, she's dead, and he's out fooling around with Donna. You couldn't find James, so you picked a fight with his gang instead. They started it after Bobby decked Ed Hurley with a pair of brass knuckles. He was defending himself. Look, I already spent a night in jail. Are you charging me with Settle something? Settle down there, punk. I could make one phone call, and you'd go so far away, God couldn't find you. Top-notch uh, voice acting by, by whoever's Mike Nelson. I mean, nailed <laughs> 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 That's Schaefer the Dark Lord, and he is actually doing all the male voices. So he's every, amazing. He's doing all of them. Wow. He's playing Cooper, and he's playing Truman, and he's playing Mike, and he's playing everybody at the same time. Amazing. In the script, you have Cooper basically interrogating both Mike and Bobby separately, and in the show, they're together. Maybe for time-wise, why don't we just put the two uh, boys together and Cooper can interrogate them together. And yeah. It actually works better, too. I love where Cooper says, then you can leave. Yep. This is the Blue Pine Lodge kitchen. We have Josie, Pete, Cooper, and Truman. On top of the morning to you, Pete. No, Josie. The expression is top of the morning. And it's just barely morning. So perhaps I should say... Bottom of the afternoon? That'd be more like it. Arf! Hello, Koro, good fellow. Is Catherine at the mill? She wanted to run a half shift on account of us closing down yesterday. I told her she was on her own. I was going fishing. Oh, Pete, I want to thank you for yesterday for standing up to me with Catherine. No, Josie, it's not you I was... Ah, forget it. Catherine was wrong yesterday. Josie, the sheriff and the gent from the FBI are here to see you. Mrs. Packard, this is Dale Cooper, FBI. Pleased to meet you, ma'am. Thank you. Can I offer you gentlemen a cup of joe? Mrs. Packard, you said the magic word. I'd love a cup, thanks. I'll get that for you. Mr. Cooper, how do you take it? Black as midnight on a moonless night. Pretty black. Please, grab yourself a chair. Ah! Look at him. What a cute little fellow. What's his name? Koro. 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 That means something. Oh, Chinese. I'm not sure exactly. My late husband Andrew named him. Big Sterning Engine, perhaps? I don't think we ever saw the dog in the show. I don't think so, ever. For some reason, they were going to have a storyline with the dog, or at least gonna, it was going to be brought up a few times. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Season two would have had the B side, the yeah. B story of the dog. <laughs> we have a Great Northern Hotel Corridor, and there's Cooper and Jacoby. I can't get over it. He just stands there day after day. I've never seen anything like it. Dr. Jacoby, how old is Johnny Horn? 27. Going on six. <laughs> just kidding. Sorry. And you've been treating him for how long? Treating him? Well, with Johnny, it's not so much a question of treating him. I understand Laura Palmer was his tutor. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, after school. Those are the same days I'd come to see Johnny and his mother. Oh, Laura was Johnny's favorite. He knew which day it was, too. He'd stand just like that, waiting for her. Does Johnny get out much? Sure, after his schoolwork. 
Laura would take him out on the grounds hunting for rubber buffalo with his little suction cup bow and arrow set. Oh, some afternoons he bagged the limit. Was she here on Wednesday afternoon? Yes, she was. I sat in with them. She read him a story. What story was that? Isn't that interesting? It was Sleeping Beauty. You said Laura was a patient of yours as well. Yes. But of course, all of that information dwells in the land of client confidentiality. Johnny loves that trick. He thinks we found over $400 back there. I think it, it comes right down to the same thing we talked about with the, the Ben scene and Bobby uh, conversation that Donna had with her mother. It said it's putting Jacoby more front and center as a as a potential suspect again. I like that they set that aside in favor of the rock throwing bottle scene in the next episode because um, it just puts all of that in one place as opposed to having it all in this episode. Yeah, I think just, just again, leads to better character moments as we saw them on screen. So I, I really do understand why they got rid of it. As fun as it is mm. and, and again, really cool to hear these acted out so brilliantly. So um, yeah, kudos to Chief of the Dark Lord for that. <laughs> <laughs> Jacoby mentions reading uh, Sleeping Beauty. I was just going to bring that up, Brady, that that kind of hints at Laura not being dead, maybe. Yeah. Um, that he found that story interesting. I know, I, obviously that's what we know from the very, very end. So that we wouldn't have got that when we watched it the first time. And I also thought like the Sleeping Beauty needs like a, a prince or a prince charming, charming. or somebody yeah, to rescue exactly. her or like a knight. And I'm like, a lot of times it seems like Cooper is this knight that, or this this guy who's supposed to be the protector. I don't know. I mean, I'm, now I'm really reaching, I think. Mm. But I was like, I got the same Sleeping thing. Beauty. Yeah. In the actual thing that he shot, which is on the, the Blu-ray, Jacoby also mentions that Johnny's favorite story was Peter Pan. And to me, he's like, Peter Pan, huh? It's like, I don't ever want to grow up. up. So Johnny mm -hmm. is, he's 26 going on six. So the idea that Johnny never <laughs> wants to grow up. Our last one we have is Dr. Jacoby's office. Laura is speaking something completely different than what was actually in the show. Hey, what's up, Doc? <laughs> it's Thursday afternoon, about four o'clock, and I'm so bored. I'm making you this tape on the pretty little tape recorder you gave me. And, as you probably already noticed, I'm going to mail it to you in the ugly little plain envelope you gave me for... What was that word you used? Confidentiality's sake. This is kind of fun. First, you're always bugging me to tell you what my dreams are. Let me tell you about this one I had last night. It was a doozy. I was in this strange room... And there was this little man and this other older man I'd never seen before either. But they both seemed to know me. There was music. And I was telling all my secrets to the older man. In the version that aired of this episode, we really did get to see a lot of the different sides of Laura Palmer. And that was something that I had kind of forgotten about. And I think to go ahead and to listen to her describe the dream sequence that we would see at the end of episode two might have been a little too much. And we as viewers definitely got more out of seeing that for the first time rather than listening to a version of it being told. It's also interesting to note how much of season one was shot out of order, particularly how episode two was the final thing filmed. And that really goes to show the strength of the writing and the planning and the plotting out of everything that happened throughout the course of those first seven episodes. It would have taken away from the power of that dream sequence, which is so iconic. It's what everybody, it's the first scene that I saw of Twin Peaks way back in 1990. So it's that iconic moment that would have been robbed of its power had it been described by Laura in the first episode. Yeah, yeah I agree. True. Yeah. They definitely knew they had gold and that they really kept on like, how can we use this? It's like, oh, maybe we can use it in episode one. And then like, they did actually end up using it in episode two, but they realized they had something and they just trying to figure out how to use it. Mm, foreshadowing. 
Yeah, and then they they really did use that in a different way with the diary page, you know, right before the killer reveal, right? They get the diary from Harold, and Cooper reads it in front of Donna, and we realize that Laura had the same dream as Cooper. Yeah. Good point, Pete. Obviously, I agree with everybody else that we didn't need to hear about it before we saw it, but after we saw it, and then we realized that Laura and Cooper had the same dream, I thought that was a strong part of that episode, and I think they saved it and used it in a different way later. Now that we've seen season three, we had the log lady in the pilot where all she was doing was flickering the lights but here we get to actually meet her for the first time really where she's in the double r mm -hmm. and cooper's like oh log lady it's like and he wants to ask her about her log she's saying one day my log will have something to say about this and you know it does play off in a few episodes later i think when they go to the woods to see her but it's interesting to see go to season three where we get to have margaret the log lady and she's talking to hawk and he's saying you know my log has a message for you and that whole thing about the something's missing and, mm -hmm. and and it's, it's really interesting to see the log lady evolve. And she really evolves over time. And she evolves through the Bravo log lady intros. And I don't know. I was just thinking how fascinating that was. And I still, I think it's still about something's missing. And I, today I was thinking, you know, it's saying something's missing, which we know is the diary page. But then we learn at the end of season three that Laura goes missing. So could... The chocolate bunny was missing. Well, yes, <laughs> there's a lot of things missing. But, uh, but uh, Pete, what are your what are your thoughts? I was going to talk a little bit about the fact that I didn't think we'd have a tie-in with Audrey telling Cooper about her brother and Laura talking with him, and then you know twenty plus twenty five plus years later, here we have Johnny Horn, the third Johnny Horn, right, sitting at a table, totally strapped down, watching his nephew brutalize his ma, his uh, grandmother. I mean, you know, that's the last character I think that I would have thought we would have seen. See the whole progression, the Jacoby talking about, and later actually they show the rubber buffalo and how depressed Johnny is. And then um, here he is almost 30 years later and uh, still in a bad way. So it, that was a surprise to me. It was interesting again to hear Audrey say mental problems, but they run in the family. And then one of the, the enduring questions from season three was, what's going on with Audrey? Is she in a mental institution or something? What happened to her? So if that is brought back from this episode, you know, if there are mental problems in the family and if Audrey has suddenly been afflicted by something, I mean, we know obviously other things must have happened to her. It was really striking to me to watch that. It kind of, I sat up and I was like, oh my goodness, like it, I'd forgotten about that part. Wow, that's a great point. Mm -hmm. I, how did I miss that? I mean, I remember that too. That's a great, and of course we know Ben Horn at, and season two has a breakdown and seems like the Civil they, War. Right. And, they all have yeah. the breakdowns. Yeah. 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 Not Sylvia, not Sylvia. <laughs> that we know of. That, yeah. 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 Right. And not Jerry either. He was just high. <laughs> <laughs> A different kind of bad binoculars. <laughs> and she plugged time for an amazing article on uh, Johnny Horn that Laura wrote. Maybe she'll say the title of it. Um, we need to talk about Johnny. Yeah, I, I do go into a lot more about him, whether um, he's obviously has got autism, but whether something happened to him somewhere along the line um, that he knows a little bit more about what happened to Laura. So, yeah, it's, it's quite an interesting one. There could have been more of a storyline with Johnny and like he he had his own secrets and, you know, Cooper would have had to try and get more information out of him. And Didn't I think that when I first watched Twin I think Peaks, you did. I the did, the yes. thought was that Johnny um, knew who the killer was and saw it happen. Yes, and that I, was your theory. My theory yeah. was that it was like, are they going to use his character down the line? Like he's going to have a breakthrough and he's going to say it. He's like, I saw it. And. That's where I thought they were going to go. Episode. You could have one episode with Johnny in that. Yeah. I totally agree with you that uh, it seemed like this was going to come back and be more important. And by the time I watched Twin Peaks the first time, I, I didn't know David Lynch very well. But going back through his works, it seems like he's really interested in, in the idea of mental illness being connected to something supernatural almost. So if... Johnny did see something or did know more, I would have expected him to come back and have something to do with the resolution of that. Mm. And and maybe, and that just seems to be part of what David Lynch and Mark Frost bring into the story for other characters that experience mental breakdowns or they, they come to some greater truth as a result of it or something because their mental illness seems to be connected to something larger than us. I think because... Laura and Johnny were very close. I think she may have sort of given up quite a lot of her secrets to him. So he may have known a lot more. And because he used to wear the Native American headdress a lot, that always hinted at something else, that he had a 
bit of a link to the past, maybe. Mm, wow. I agree, yeah. yeah. The only thing I was going to say was about Coop. I think he seemed a lot more dark than I remembered. And he was far more flirtatious with not just Audrey, but Shelley as well, which I was quite surprised. There was definitely more of a dark side to him than I remember. Huh. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Uh, I had a little note here to, uh, you know, that Cooper was, was kind of creepy when when he was, uh, you know, watching Audrey kind of fidget in her seat and talk, you could see, a, I don't know, maybe a little bit of Mr. C there. Um, the other thing that I thought was kind of funny is part 17 of season three, you know, Cooper rushes in and everything's going on in the sheriff's station. He didn't really have time, I don't think, to, you know, process that Bobby um, <laughs> was in, in being interrogated for Laura's murder. And now he turns around and he's got a, a, a you know, a deputy's badge on. I mean, that must have been... <laughs> You know, if it didn't have everything else going on, Cooper pro- probably would have been like, what the, you know, how did this happen? Yeah. It was like most of us uh, were like, uh, really? He, he turned it around. Great for him. Well, maybe, maybe during those uh, fishing trips with uh, Major Briggs, Major Briggs would talk about his son. It's like, you know, he's going to turn out all right when he gets older. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any clues that Leland was the killer? And I like talking about this just because when when Brian and I first went through the whole series, it was new for him, and I couldn't talk about Leland and that yeah. he's the killer. So, I mean, I don't know if there's much here, because in this, there's only one scene where Donna comes in to the Palmer house to see Sarah, and uh, Leland says, you know, try not to upset her. <laughs> and then she sits down with Sarah, and Sarah thinks she sees her daughter, Laura, and then she screams, and she sees bob at the foot of uh laura's bed Mm -hmm. sarah might know something so you know don't bother her too much here like this is this she might be unstable so he should be consulting her Uh, he should be with her why why is he sending the neighbor the the best friend to go over there like he should be the one so that's a it's a red flag right there yeah i didn't really see anything here i thought his uh his comforting of of sarah when she's screaming would seem pretty genuine i didn't Mm -hmm. see him leer at uh um, Donna, when she, you know, walked away like he did in in later in uh, season two. Um, this is a question though. When does uh, Leland say, "Go ahead, Sarah, tell him about your two visions"? Is that is that in the pilot or is that in an episode after this? I mean, I think I might be two more episodes or so. It's- yeah, well, I think then that this shows that clearly as it progresses, and we didn't see, of course, the scene where Leland's having the conversation with the funeral director, but this shows that you know Leland is. He's kind of okay. He's helping out, and things just start deteriorating. And you know, he's he kind of loses his patience with the whole situation uh, uh, over the course of the next couple episodes. And of course, episode three is the classic where you know Laura's funeral. He jumps into the uh, jumps onto the casket. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then, where do we stand with Sarah? Is Sarah Judy? Do we think? I mean, I don't wonder where you guys all stand with. I mean, like, if we're looking at season three, is she, uh, what do we call that, flying bug thing? There, it's the jumping man, or I think it's that insect creature oh, that goes yeah, into yeah, the yeah. girl and stuff. But I guess if she is Judy or she's Judith, it, it still, does she not know that she is an uh, evil entity? I don't know. Because you, you generally feel like Sarah is, is upset. Albert after the killer is revealed, describes Bob as potentially being the evil that men do. Mm-hmm. What would you describe the person that stands by and potentially has a clue that evil is happening in their house but doesn't do anything about it? Yeah. That to me that to me is Judy. That to me is Sarah Palmer. You can call it whatever you want. I choose not to really look at it in a supernatural sense, but I go back to that analogy that Albert gives when I think about the whole Sarah Judy connection. And I mean, we could probably spend a few hours on this topic alone because they certainly gave us a lot to think about. But when I when I go back and I have started to view the original series through season three eyes, I look at Sarah as being upset, but not in a supernatural sense, upset in the fact that she realizes that she knew something was happening on some level. Mm. Maybe she wasn't completely implicit, but her uh, maternal instincts had to throw up some red flags, and she didn't do anything to stop it. But she also was drugged, and she really didn't know what was going on fully. She was drugged. She was drugged, but I Mm -hmm. I agree with Andrew. I feel like she had to, in some sense, know it was. Yo, no, I agree. I agree. She did, but I I I think because she was drugged, it really threw her off. 
And I do think you make a great point there. You know, she was drugged. The series in Fire Walk With Me showed us that. But there were also scenes in Fire Walk With Me, such as the dinner table scene, that yeah. showed them all together where she was not sedated, where she saw Leland in a state that really was not his normal state. He was very aggressive, and he was mm. grabbing Laura by the hand and looking at her fingernails. And the cheeks, so she, she doesn't like that. And it's like, what do you know of she, what she likes? Yeah, and, stuff, yeah. Yeah. and that to me says that Sarah knew that there was something going on under her nose, and I, I do think that potentially that might be one of the big themes that really is the series of a whole, is evil happens under our nose. What are we going to do about it? There's a great quote from David Lynch and Lynch on Lynch when he's talking about serial killers and how afterwards everybody always says like oh but they seem like such a great guy mm -hmm. and that to me is sarah palmer like oh my husband yeah. seemed like such a great guy but evil was happening right under her nose yeah good point uh yeah i was gonna bring up the the idea that she she was drugged so let's give her a little bit of the benefit of the doubt here but it still brings up a lot of questions in light of season three because leland was drugging her and i i'm not sure if that was leland or bob doing that but if it's bob doing it and Bob knows Judy or is seeking Judy out, what does it say that Bob is in control of Leland when he's drugging Sarah to keep Judy down maybe? Or, or what? what is the purpose of him drugging her? Like there's all sorts of questions that come up about that and, and that lead to the question about what the relationship is really between mm -hmm. Bob and Zhao Day or Judy or however you want to put it that I just don't think we have answers to yet. We could... I think Andrew's right. We could go on for hours talking about what this means, but it really does complicate things. That whole situation is just so complex. It's really hard to like pinpoint anything down. There's just more questions after season three, especially coming back and watching this scene. Definitely. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Is there anything else we want to talk about uh, in regard to episode one? Something that I thought was really cool that I definitely wanted to give mention to was that Dwayne Dunham got to direct this episode. He was the editor for the pilot episode. And when you think about how much time had passed since the filming of the pilot to when they filmed episode one, a lot of those actors, you know, they had moved on to other roles and done other things in between. And to have somebody that was so closely associated to the project come in and direct that first episode, he was really able to bring them back into that world. Yeah. You know, besides Lynch and Frost, Dwayne Dunham was probably closer to the project than anybody at that point, just by virtue of being the editor. Therefore, I thought I thought he made the perfect choice to direct this first episode. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know if you know why that why he got to direct, but <laughs> David Lynch wanted him to edit Wild at Heart, and he <laughs> said he was busy. He said he, he actually had another commitment, so he couldn't do it. And he and Lynch kept on pushing him and pushing him, and Dwayne said, well, edit while at heart, it'd be able to direct. Mm -hmm. And that's how David Lynch was like, okay, you can direct the first episode <laughs> of Twin <Wow>. Peaks. <laughs> but it, it does make perfect sense. I mean, he, you're right. He knows the material the best, and he did a fabulous job. I mean, I do love that opening of you just panning around Cooper's room and then see Cooper's upside down. It's just brilliant. Yep. What are you guys working on on 25 Years Later? My stuff's probably the least interesting. Um <laughs> I'm not really doing a whole lot of writing at the moment. It's more the the boring behind the scenes editorial kind of stuff. Well, congratulations again on on the uh, the I guess rebranding or just I love that you guys we have love it. it. Yeah, it's yeah. awesome. It's what it, I always want to make sure I get it right. It's 25 years later, uh, damn fine TV and film. Yes, That's it. Got it. Awesome. Much like Andrew, my my job is behind the scenes and boring and editorial, but um, I am working on a piece right now. It's been kind of in the process of being written for several months, and I'm hoping it'll be out by the middle of April, end of April. So by the time this episode airs, it'll be out. But um, about violence against women and just how that's reflected in Twin Peaks, especially in light of you know, the recent Me Too and Time's Up movements and how, how should we look at that? It's going to be a controversial topic. I'm totally expecting that, but I think it's important to talk about. That's awesome. That's really cool. And, you know, you also do Bickering Peaks podcast. And I really, yes. I love the One Saliva Bubble that you recently did. I don't think I've ever heard any podcast cover that. So I was really excited when uh, when you guys did that. I got to take a listen. Cool. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed doing it. And I mean, getting to sit down. I mean, I love working with my husband Aiden and we get to sit and talk about this stuff every two weeks, which is really cool. But to actually be able to read something as opposed to just watching it was really different for us. So that was that was really cool. And it's a great script. I think everybody should, especially if you're a Twin Peaks fan, you definitely should go read it because it's really interesting. So 
Am I right? Was it Mark Frost and David Lynch that wrote that together? Is that right? They did. Oh, that's yes, cool. that's correct. They wrote it um, before Twin Peaks, or very close around around the time, like after uh, Goddess fell apart, their story about uh, Marilyn Monroe, but before Twin Peaks. And they got all the way up to like locations and, and they were, I think, six weeks away maybe from shooting when Dino De Laurentiis' company went belly up. So it was close. They'd cast people it was it was gonna it was a go so wow. i just can't imagine what that would have been like to see it i really i recommend everybody check out bickering peaks podcast yeah and you, uh, oh tell your husband you guys did such a great job for um our best of show you two like knocked it out of the park there <laughs> yes you did the commercials for uh... those were the best <laughs> i do love the department store one you yes. had uh, you guys were awesome yeah yeah that was a lot of fun thanks for having us on yeah. that that was a, that was really a lot of fun so and that yeah. was part of i mean i've always wanted to do these uh, these scripts and go behind the scenes of these uh, Twin Peaks scripts, but but you guys doing that show really said, you know what, we could pull this off. Yeah, we yeah, got yeah. talented people like Lindsay and so many other people. We could actually go in and and do so much more. Yeah, I didn't know what to expect from people when I reached out, but I was like, holy smokes! I was like, Ben, this is like great. <laughs> wow, yeah. awesome. And Laura, what are you working on? Um, again, similarly, I'm not really writing anything, but I'm still doing the We Are the Art Life um, project. Uh, so next week, we've got Thor Amelie, I think. <laughs> Hopefully, if uh, if we get that done ready. Yeah, I'm gonna, um, and this won't come um, out until, yeah. this is coming out in May. So May. <laughs> you, you won't oh, okay. Be... So yes, by then, yes. We oh. Hopefully, it will definitely be out. <laughs> so, and yeah, and so I'm mostly editing because uh, now I am executive editor cool. as of last week. So that's That's cool. awesome. Thanks to Andrew and Lindsay for that. Thank you. <laughs> and Pete. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. And, yeah, we've been just super busy employing people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Taking on a lot of writers. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, first, I want to thank Andrew for the opportunity. I've been writing a column biweekly, uh, Un Homme Solitaire, Fans in a Living Novel. I get to talk to people about their experience as Twin Peaks fans and kind of weave their stories into um, you know, some of the reflections of, of my own and experiences that we may have shared. Um, I've, got to, I've gotten to talk to a, a lot of cool people. Um, hopefully want to continue to talk to a lot of cool people. And right now I just finished a, an interview uh, with Charles de Lazarica uh, about his, um, I would call it a um, box set trilogy, Slice of Lynch, Between Two Worlds, and um, A Very Lovely Dream. And we had a great time talking about all three of those. And that's going to be woven together um, for one of our Lynch Night articles it's funny, Ben, last time when, when I was interviewing you guys, you made a comment that if you had it your way, you would be more of a producer and let everybody else talk. Yes. Well, tonight you have tonight three of the four people that you had as guests happen to have that same mentality. Isn't that funny? <laughs> <Isn't> that <great? laughs> and then you guys all talked and I didn't have to talk, so thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We love this. Uh, you guys are great. I really love the site. I'm always impressed. I mean, every day I'm checking out what you guys are writing and I was like, wow, how do they keep this up and and how do they keep on putting out such great work and you guys are just it's amazing. amazing it really yeah. is yeah and i really rec you. recommend everybody listening go to 25 years later site.com check out your works and uh yeah it's so it's been a great panel thank you guys so much for covering episode one and i hope we can do this again sometime absolutely so today we are recording obviously prior to when this episode is going to film but it happens to be a few hours before one John Bernardi's birthday. So when he listens to this in a month or so, just know that we were thinking about you, buddy. Tomorrow's your birthday. <laughs> just wanted to give you a special mention. Uh, it's from the past to the future. <laughs> what year Happy is birthday, it, John? John? What year is Was it? He, he turns, uh, what is he, 85 tomorrow? Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a big thank you to the Pink Room for doing such an amazing job with today's clip. Schaefer the Dark Lord, Francine the Lucid Dream, CD Edie, uh, Bunny Buxom, and Minx Arcania. 
Yes, thank you to the 25 Years Later team and to the Pink Room burlesque team. They did an amazing job. Last month, we had the 25 Years Later cast, and then we get the Pink Room this time. It gets better and it's better. It's amazing. They're, they are great. I, to me, it's like a childhood dream to be able like I remember when, like, you know, when we younger reading these scripts and saying, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we had gotten to see these scenes? And now we have people actually bre- breathing life into these characters, and I love it. And they're not just reading them. Like you say, they're breathing life into yes, them. Yes, they're breathing life into them and they're making they're acting them out and they're it's so much fun i know it's a oh my god i i am a big fan of just listening to the work of th- these episodes being put together by you and everybody in the community i listen to these as a fan you know we do the show but yes. listening to it is just so cool yeah, it's pretty it's pretty special. So I'm we're gonna do this again. We won't be doing this till next month. We do this once a month. In June. I actually got an email recently who was kinda like, Yeah, they got, yeah, they get it. It's like, oh, there's a lot of work to be put into this show. <laughs> so if we and it's nice to kind of just, you know, take our time and enjoy the the show once a month here. So Yeah. And a quick tease for next week, we're gonna have somebody who was part of season three behind the camera. I'm not I just leave it at that. I think we already mentioned it in a live show, didn't we? Uh, you have to go back to the live show. You have to go show. back to the live show. Right, but we do have a, a crew member from season three yeah. who we talked to. Yeah, next week. So tune in for that. And if you got a comment question or you just want to say, hey, guys, nice, nice job, leave us an email at twinpeaksunwrapped at gmail.com. We're on the iTunes. Leave us a five-star review. Leave us a nice little comment that allows our show to be seen by others. Along with that, we are now on Spotify, we're on Google Play, we're on Stitcher. We're everywhere. We're everywhere. Like us on Facebook at Twin Peaks Unwrapped. Follow us at Twin Peaks Unwrapped on the old Twitter. We're going to be doing our next live show in the end of May. And I don't know. The end of this month. The end of this month. And stay tuned to find out what we're going to be, what platform we'll be going live on, because I don't really know right now. I know. We we debate on whether we want to continue Twitter or do we want to go to YouTube. Or You let us know. Write to us and say, where should we be live? Yeah, that'd be great to know. Maybe on the moon. (laughs) Yeah, what do you want? You want us to go live from the moon? We'll do that. No, what what platform should we be on? Should we go to YouTube next? Should we go back to Twitter? Should we go back to Facebook? Facebook. Some some people really hate it when we went on Facebook. They really, like, they don't use Facebook. Well, no matter what platform we use, you're going to find a handful of people who are not on that platform. Right. You know? So that's them be the breaks, as they say. And so let us know. Um, and that's it. That's it. We'll see you next week for our special guest who is behind the camera in season three. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, but I just, I can't get over it. I mean, he just stands like that all day. I've never seen anything like it. Dr. Jacoby, how old is Johnny Horner? Well, he's 627. Going on six. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just kidding. You've been treating him for how long? Treating him? Treating him. Well, with Johnny, it's it's not exactly a question of treating him. I understand Laura Palmer was his tutor. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those were the days that I'd come to see Johnny and his mother. Laura was, was Johnny's favorite. And you know, he knew which day it was, too. He'd stand outside of the door for hours just... Waiting for him. Johnny get out much? Sure. After school work. Yeah, Laura used to bring him out here on the grounds to hunt for these little buffalo that I made for him. <laughs> hey, some days, some afternoons, he, he bagged the whole limit. Is Laura here on Wednesday afternoon? Sure. Sure. In fact, I, I sat in with him. She read him a story. What story was that? Now, isn't that interesting? It was Sleeping Beauty. Ha! Johnny usually prefers Peter Pan. (laughs) I understand Laura Palmer was a patient of yours as well. Yes, but of course, (laughs) all of that information dwells in the land of client confidentiality. Hold it. Hold it. Look at that. <laughs> hey, come on. Johnny loves that trick. Thinks we found over a hundred dollars back there. <laughs> <laughs>